Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to session 26B1, uh, treating phosphorus in stormwater using current data to design for success. My name is Ronnie Piowski with Osborne Consulting, and I will be your monitor for this session. Now allow me to introduce Jeremiah Lehman. Jeremiah is a regional regulatory manager for Contech Engineered Solutions, focusing on the Northwest US. During his 20 years as a stormwater engineer, he has been active in the design development and performance testing of innovative stormwater treatment systems throughout the US, Italy, and New Zealand. He holds a master's degree in environmental engineering from Tulane University and is a registered PE in the state of Washington. All right, good morning. Thanks everybody for showing up. Last uh, slot of the conference is always, is always a gamble, but I'm happy to see folks here. And uh, yes, we're gonna be talking about phosphorus today, treating it in stormwater. Um, it's important, we got that nice shot right there of Lake Erie. Uh, you can see during a, a harmful algae bloom. And uh, it's one of the primary motivations we have to treat phosphorus is to prevent things like this from happening. So just to give you an overview of how we're going to structure this, we're going to talk a little bit about the background of phosphorus pollution in urban stormwater, um, talk about some of the regulations that govern treatment of that and kind of the performance targets associated with it. We're going to look at removal mechanisms, different unit operations associated with removing phosphorus and some of the challenges associated with that. And then we're gonna get into some data. So we've got a number of different sources to look at actual BMP uh, data and kind of compare and contrast the performance of some of the different BMPs based on the unit operations that they employ. After that, we'll take a look at some of the design considerations and conclusions we can get out of this. And then um, I'll, hopefully you have some questions. So a little background, phosphorus over there, atomic number 15 sitting underneath its, its nutrient buddy nitrogen. Um, it is a biological nutrient. It's necessary for all life, and it's commonly found throughout the environment in a bunch of different forms. It's uh, highly reactive, so we never have phosphorus in an elemental form by itself. It's always attached to something, reacted to something, um, and it can be in organic or inorganic forms. Um, it is the most commonly regulated stormwater nutrient. We'll get into those regs in just a second. And the real thing that I wanna focus on here that governs the treatment of is, is the speciation between phosphorus forms. So whether it's in the dissolved phase or the particulate phase has a big impact on the mechanisms that are successful for treating it. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the analyses. There's, like I said, there's a bunch of forms of it. I'm gonna focus in terms of the data on total phosphorus and orthophosphate. So why is this important? Why are we worried about phosphorus in the environment? Uh, big deal is eutrophication. So this is, this is when excess phosphorus loads get into freshwater systems. I should stress that uh, phosphorus is the limiting nutrient in freshwater. Um, in salt water, it's more leaning towards nitrogen, but uh, we're talking about mostly freshwater systems here. Excess phosphorus gets in there and can lead to huge blooms of algae, right? Phosphorus gets in there, it's like, it's like Kool-Aid to a 10 year old. It just goes nuts, phosphorus in there, algae blooms uh, explode. And then over time, this algae mass dies. And as it does, it decomposes and that consumes dissolved oxygen out of there, out of the water body that deprives it from other species. Uh, this can lead to mass fish die-offs. Um, I don't know of any recent cases out and around here, but certainly throughout the, the US, this is still an ongoing problem. Um, additionally, those algae blooms can block sunlight from penetrating through the water column and can prevent the growth of beneficial plants. In the urban environment, we see, we see a lot of different sources of phosphorus. Um, primarily, it's coming from decaying biomass, uh, but also from fertilizer sources, various detergents, animal waste, uh, infiltration or interception from septic systems, so a lot of different places where this is coming from. I wanna to touch on agriculture really quickly. Agricultural runoff is full of phosphorus, but it is regulated far differently than uh, municipal sources. And so we're gonna stick kind of with the, uh, the urban setting, common urban settings. Going back to this idea of the speciation of it. 
which is really important. So when we're measuring phosphorus, you know, a number of different analytical methods for doing so. Um, the most common one is just total phosphorus. Now this includes the particulate phase, so stuff that's adsorbed to particles, as well as what's dissolved. Just whatever's in that sample, we're analyzing the whole thing. Um, if we want to look at just the dissolved phase, there's a couple different ways to do this. I mentioned earlier, the data we'll be focusing on is orthophosphate. This is the most common way to, to analyze dissolved phosphorus. Uh, orthophosphate is the simplest inorganic form of phosphorus, and it's what uh, is directly available for, for algae uh, for, and aquatic species like that to, to consume. But it doesn't really necessarily tell us the entire amount of dissolved phase phosphorus. So when we're in an analytical setting, dissolved simply means that the sample has been passed through a 0.45 micron filter. So it can be attached to clay particles that are perhaps smaller than that or colloidal complexes um, and not have that orthophosphate ionic um, speciation to it, but still be classified as dissolved. So another way to, to uh, look at it is total dissolved phosphorus, which is the same analysis as total phosphorus, but you pass it through that 0.45 uh, micron filter first. The speciation of this, so the fraction in terms of how much is dissolved, how much is associated with particulate is, has been shown to vary. Um, there's a lot of research ongoing to quantify that because it's important to know what this fraction is when we're considering how to meet regulatory goals with, uh, with phosphorus. Um, so you can see here, here's some research results that, that indicate you know, it's pretty much mostly particulate phase. Um, the data can range depending on seasonality. Uh, land use has a lot to do with it. You know, in the, in the fall, when you've got decaying leaf matter, you're prone to seeing a lot more dissolved phase stuff out there. Uh, but generally we think of it a little more than 50% is probably associated with with particulates. So since the speciation varies so much, when we're defining our regulatory goals and trying to come up with design methods to treat it, it's really important that we consider how we're measuring it and what the analytical methods are gonna to be to define uh, our success. So treating phosphorus is tricky. We talk about this speciation. Well, it doesn't necessarily stay in one form or another. So it can come into a treatment system as a particulate and then break down and be released in the dissolved phase. And this is one of my favorite uh, photos from, from years of uh, monitoring, field monitoring that I've, that I've had the, the uh, good fortune to experience. And uh, this, is, this is from a media filter, a cartridge-based media filter study that was done in Olympia um, some years ago. And it was, you know, the middle of spring, had this lovely flashy rainfall event and my partner and I rush out to the site, we crack open the vault to get our samples out. And it looked like, it looked like a, a bag of confetti had exploded in there. It's just bright pink, which you don't expect when you're opening up a storm vault, right? Um, so on this site are a number of uh, ornamental cherry trees and all the blossoms had come off kind of as they tend to do within like a week of each other, right? So all of this stuff was entrained into the storm system and was removed by these filters. And uh, so we're like, great, we've got great phosphorus removal data because there it is, it's all right there. You know, it looked, they looked like, those cartridges looked like, uh, you, if you're familiar with old hostess dessert cakes, you know the ones, little pink snowball things? I'm seeing some nods, most of y'all are healthy parents, didn't let you eat those things. But anyway, so we, we take a look at this storm event, we got really, really good phosphorus removal, right? Um, however, the media that's in here is just an inert media that's based for removing particulate matter. And over the next couple of weeks, while we waited patiently for another event to come through, this stuff decomposed. So a couple of weeks later, we catch another storm event. We go out there, we've got terrible phosphorus numbers because all of this stuff had been sitting in here and slowly uh, turned into dissolved phase and leached out. So I tell the story because we really need to look at active mechanisms in order to address both the dissolved and the particulate based phase. And estimating dissolved phase with orthophosphorus is, is pretty common, but we're gonna see from the data that might not be the best way to go about it. And if we've got roughly 
of your phosphorus bound to particulates. And you've got say a 60 or 70% total phosphorus treatment goal. Well, treating the TSS or the particulate bound stuff is not gonna suffice, right? You're gonna need to have to tackle that, that tricky dissolved phase. Looking at some of the regulations that, uh, that govern removal out there, uh, here in Washington, the target is 50% removal of total phosphorus. You'll notice all of these goals are for total phosphorus. Uh, Minnesota is a bit higher. You know, throughout the country, we see these things vary there, but they're typically around 50, 60%. And uh, when, when they have state level uh, regulations to begin with. Now, obviously this is geography dependent. A place like Minnesota has got a lot more freshwater bodies than say Arizona, right? So, um, but in some places that have seen a lot of dramatic impact like Lake Erie here, uh, they have to, the, the agencies that are responsible for this really have to coordinate amongst themselves. Uh, we did mention agricultural runoff is, is a big source of this. So in Ohio, for instance, there's a multi-agency effort where they've all coordinated together, which, uh, which is rare sometimes, you know, when we're talking about different state agencies uh, in order to really get their strategies together and address this. We also see phosphorus regulations in the forms of 303D listings, right? So total maximum daily load allocations. Uh, total phosphorus leads all the nutrient TMDLs that are out there. There's over 4,000 of them. Last I looked at uh, EPA statistics. But uh, interestingly enough, if we looked, I couldn't find any that were specific to dissolved phosphorus. And orthophosphate or orthophosphorus was only listed in 37 uh, specific instances here. So that's per, per when I put this together last year. So it might have changed something, but you can note the disparity. We're really in regulations focusing on that total fraction. Uh, 72 listings here in Washington. So let's Lake Whatcom up there in Bellingham, if you've ever had a chance to visit that beautiful city. Uh, there is a, a big TMDL listed for that lake. And, uh, you know, sometimes the state level stuff or, or specific water body TMDLs aren't, aren't sufficient, right? Because it's really highly mobile. I moved out here from Louisiana and we're pretty well aware of mobility in the uh, Mississippi River Basin here, which is illustrated on this, on this map. And so you see concentrations of phosphorus getting larger downstream, right? This makes sense. We've got, especially with the agricultural runoff through the middle of the country, and so this can lead to this can lead to impacts that are pretty geographically removed from the actual sources of the contamination. Um, in extreme cases, it can lead to large areas of, of, of permanent low dissolved oxygen in waters, uh, resulting in dead zones. So there goes your favorite fishing spot if you're down in southern Louisiana. Um, a couple other ways to do this: regional TMDLs like the Chesapeake Bay. You know, and uh, Virginia's got a really interesting credit trading program where they will basically purchase an upstream uh, land area, like a farm or something like that, and let it go fallow in order to offset development further downstream. There's some issues with that. You're still concentrating it in developed areas. So have a, we haven't really seen the impact of that. Uh, over enough time, I would say, to really uh, see how effective that, that strategy is. So let's get out of the regulations and start talking about uh, treatment processes. Um, again, with, with a lot of this stuff associated with particulate, you can get some removal from standard sedimentation practices, ponds, things like that. Uh, but we do know that it has a tendency to break down and release in dissolved phase. So I'm focusing here more on, on some higher level unit processes, uh, notably here filtration, okay? And I'm gonna split this into two different categories. You've got different filters that are um, physical or just inert medias. And this would include something like, like a bulk sand filter or a, a cartridge filter with perlite or some sort of inert media that's basically operating just on the basis of physically straining out particulate matter. Uh, membrane filters are also becoming more common out there. Um, so these are, these are our inert medias. They're good at removing TSS. They're not doing anything to actively capture anything in the dissolved phase, right? 
We do, however, have active or sorptive media filters. Um, these do the opposite, right? They've got some kind of some kind of passive, chemically active uh, property property to them that aids in sorption or uh, ion exchange or um, surface precipitation, some mechanism to capture the the dissolved phase directly and entrain it onto that uh, media surface area. So this would include stuff like granular activated carbon, activated alumina, uh, zeolites, et cetera. Finally, we've got biological processes. These are very effective in sequestering phosphorus, you know, so that the, the phosphorus is being literally taken up into the, uh, the structures of, of biological creatures. You know, a lot of that stuff is happening within plants, uh, with macroinvertebrates kind of in the, in the rhizome area in bioretention systems shown here. Um, so bioretention systems we're going to focus on for a minute because here, this is kind of the best of both worlds, right? You've got physical filtration, you've got some active filtration with compost in the media, and you've got these biological processes to help uh, kind of get the bang for your buck, so to speak. And as we know, these have these have grown in use and popularity and regulatory preference uh, over the last 10, 15 years, and they're sort of ubiquitous now. But there's a problem here that we'll get into with the data, which is depending on how the whatever the specification is for that bioretention media, you can end up actually creating a source of export for phosphorus. And typically we see this with compost. Right, the standard long running uh, bioretention specification in Washington has traditionally been a 60 40 blend of sand and compost. Well, it turns out, put too much compost in there, which you need to support the plant life that's assimilating these nutrients, right, can actually cause a leaching effect and uh, discharge phosphorus over time. So, uh, you know, it's a little simplified, but uh, the analogy there is are you being a sponge? with this and, and really absorbing everything or are you building a tea bag that's just going to steep this stuff out over time this is an issue that washington has come uh face on to address and uh here when was this last year they released this specification for high performance uh bioretention soil mixes so Noting through studies that have been going going for a while that there is this problem with leaching phosphorus, they've, they've split the spec for phosphorus sensitive receiving waters uh, to eliminate compost from it. And uh, you can see here, this is a little small, but you can kind of see how this specification is now. Depending on the treatment performance goals, uh, there's three different types that Washington has, has uh, classified here. And the, they replace the compost completely in the primary media layer with a blend of biochar and coconut coir. So that gets you your absorption um, without, without acting as that, as that phosphorus source. Probably a little easier looking at a, at a cross section of it here. Now notice you've got these distinct layers and in order to facilitate uh, growth, if you do want that LID credit, if you do want those plants on site, um, they recommend no more than a two inch layer of compost across the top. So that's enough to sustain the plant life, but not enough to act as a, as a leaching source. But looking at these layers, this is a lot more difficult to install than previously with just a 60-40 blend that you can just kind of dump in there, get it in your graded properly, have your under drained. These are distinct layers. At the bottom there, there's a polishing layer of activated alumina and iron, I believe. In the middle there is, is, your, is your sand and biochar, et cetera. So suddenly we're looking at a, a far more complicated uh, design and specification for a standard bioretention system. To complicate matters even more, ecology recommends that each of the components undergo some pretty thorough uh, testing and qualification in order to make sure that it meets spec. So this list here is just, <clears throat> these are all the tests that are required to uh, just for the biochar alone. You know, make sure that you're under these parts per million of nickel, selenium, zinc, don't have too many PAHs floating around in it. 
The responsibility for demonstrating that you meet these specs is split between the specifier and the manufacturer. Um, so in these cases, it's, uh, these tests can run upwards of $100 or more for each test. So you can start to think to yourself, if I have to do this for every single project, the price of these things is gonna go up dramatically. We're gonna, right now, there's a lot of ongoing testing to see that, uh, how well these new specs are going. Uh, but that's specific to here in Washington. Uh, Ecology expects to implement these requirements in the next version of their manual. So wait for that with bated breath. However, outside of here, there's a lot of other data sources that we can look at. Here's the fun part, right? So um, I love to go to the International BMP database, the International Stormwater BMP database. Um, has anybody ever heard of that in here? Yes, wonderful, good. So this is a collaborative effort. EPA, ASCE were first together on this, and then I think it's currently under WERF. Um, but they released a, a recently released a um, summary of different statistical results from it. So there's thousands and thousands of storm events in here from all over the place, and it's all field data. It's a little hard to parse out sometimes. So this summary document is, is really important. And we're gonna get into some of the data of it, but I wanna emphasize that four categories of manufactured treatment systems were added into this. And that includes high rate biofiltration and high rate media filtration. So these are typically proprietary systems that use specialized uh, media and can consist of, of either that inert or active media um, that we talked about earlier. And I've got highlighted here, if you can see that, standard bioretention and the high rate biofiltration and high rate media filtration. Uh, we're gonna focus on those data. There we go. Um, here we go. So these box, box plots show a statistical summary, right, of each of these uh, BMP categories. BR there is bioretention, and then the HRBF and HRMF are the media filters and bio, biofilters respectively, or inversely. Um, influent is shown with these lighter shaded boxes and then the effluent with the darker, right? So you can see here, just looking at TSS, we've got good performance across the board for these things. And that shouldn't be a surprise. Most of these systems are designed to remove particulates first and foremost. When we look at phosphorus, this is total phosphorus now, <clears throat> the bioretention systems aren't doing so well. So we would expect that they're getting rid, they're getting rid of most of the uh, phosphorus associated with the particulate phase. Um, so that must indicate that, you know, if total phosphorus is, is removal is not great or even not there at all, um, the dissolved phase must be what's, what's impacting this. Our manufactured systems seem to, be, seem to be performing pretty well over there. Let's take it a step further and look at the orthophos. There we go. Yep, this is precisely what we predicted, right? Bioretention systems are spewing out dissolved phosphorus in this. Um, there was not enough data for the high rate biofilters. That's why that's, that's why that's empty there to meet the statistical requirements of the summary. And the media filters, eh, can't really say if that's doing one thing or another. The confidence intervals are pretty close to each other. Now, remember though, this, this media filter category includes both those active and the inert filter systems. So we need a different data source to get into the weeds on uh, the difference there. And to do that, we, we look here to the Department of Ecology's TAPE program. Anybody familiar with this one? No. So this is the country's premier test protocol for evaluating manufactured or emerging uh, treatment BMPs for stormwater. It's a super rigorous protocol. Having been through it a couple times, uh, it takes, takes a lot of resources, a lot of efforts. There's specific treatment requirements shown here are the basic goal, which is just TSS. And uh, phosphorus treatment goal is that 50% total phosphorus. And what makes this pretty hard to go through are the qualification criteria. You can't just sample any given storm event. Ecology has their definitions on how long the storm is, how much it rained, what the intensity was, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's a bit of an art and well-practiced exercise to get through this protocol. But a lot of them have, and there's a, I'm looking here at 10 different manufactured treatment devices, uh, which were approved for phosphorus treatment. So they went through that protocol and achieved 50% or better removal. 
Within this, we've got three media filters, three membrane filters that are inert, three other filters that use an active media. So we're hoping now we can actually see in that data whether that active media component is, is impacting uh, the orthophosphate. And then four high rate biofiltration systems. So all of these results are taken from the technical evaluation reports that are freely available and publicly available. Uh, that is, it is taken from the raw data, however, I want to make sure and, and note that when ecology is, is uh, evaluating performance, they use some pretty complicated statistics to evaluate that and the confidence intervals have to be such. And I'm just looking at the raw data here, but it is real storm events. And it's uh, seven different sites over 10 years, I think, in Washington and Oregon. So good body of data to look at. We're looking at the membrane filters here. Remember, these are the inert filters. They don't have any sorption capacity. Um, I've got effluent versus influent. And on the left there, you can see the total phosphorus performance. This is from those three different systems. And pretty good. Looking at around 75% removal, good spread of data, you know, pretty well grouped. We look at the ortho P, it's not so good at all. We kind of expected that though, because again, these systems don't target dissolved phase. I would take that data with a grain of salt though. Uh, if you look at those concentrations, they're pretty low, right? And as we know, it's hard to remove a high percentage of a, a number that's already low. So more data needs to definitely come in here to evaluate that but it lines up with our expectations. If we look at the active media filters, we see the same thing on the total side, uh, pretty good removal. The ortho P, the data is pretty scattered, but it is across a good range of influent. Um, this data is a little limited. One of the systems did not have sufficient ortho P performance in there. So you can see that's why the population there, 38 points is less than the corresponding total phosphorus points, right? But overall, these active media filters seem to be outpacing their inert uh, counterparts, which again is per our expectation. We look at high rate biofilters, performance for total phosphorus, very good. Remember, all of these had to get at least 50% removal to be included in this analysis. So, um, and on the dissolved side, we've got a pretty good range and we're seeing decent removal over there. Um, these high rate filters are specified with media that typically like the new uh, Washington Ecology spec does not use compost, or if it does, it's in, it's in very small quantities. So the manufacturers of these systems are obviously doing a pretty good job of balancing the need to support the plant life that's in them versus acting as the, the source and becoming that tea bag that nobody wants to be a tea bag. We looked at a lot of different data throughout this and tried to find some other cool concluding uh, correspondences or correlations. And nothing really jumped up except for this one really jumped out to me. This is simply looking at orthophosphorus as a fraction of total. And you see it's down there at like 10%. So this definitely flies in the face of our concept of like a 50-50 particulate to dissolve split. Um, this had me kind of confused because this is, a, like I said, this is seven different sites over years and years of study. Um, so it could also be, however, that uh, orthophosphate is simply not as good a, uh, an estimate of the dissolved phase of phosphorus as we thought it was. So wrapping it up here, throughout all the data that's been collected, it's small, but if you can see the price of gas on that sign, that's an indication of how long I've been out there collecting rain. Uh, our total phosphorus performance, we're pretty good at that, right? We, we can hit at least these 50% uh, goals that are, that are common because most systems are really good at removing particulate. But in special sensitive areas or elsewhere around the country where you wanna have a little more focus on preventing these algal blooms and, and preserving freshwater environments, we really need to look at the, uh, the dissolved phase. Um, the statistical evaluation that we have there from the tape data is not as good as I'd like it to be. So I encourage anybody who's out there testing to populate the international BMP database with your results. Uh, they will take all studies, small, large, and uh, intermediate. And again, that the, the res one result that really surprised me was how that ortho P fraction was, was so low, right? So what does this mean when we're going into design? 
you know, choose your media as well. Choose them very thoughtfully. I mean, uh, when you're examining your receiving bodies for phosphorus sensitivity, uh, definitely there's TMDLs to consider, but, um, you know, seasonal maintenance can also be a good way to handle this and keep leaves and stuff like that from decomposing inside your, your treatment systems. Um, and when you're specifying these, make sure you know what kind of media you're looking at, whether it's just simply inert or if it's active. Typically, you want those higher performance numbers in correspondence with those active medias. Um, recommendations for future, just let's keep on studying this stuff. I don't see nutrients and phosphorus in general as backsliding from a regulatory perspective. Um, I can only imagine that it's going to get more stringent throughout the country. So the more data we have, the more informed decisions we can make, right? And with that, I'll take any questions. Thanks. Yes, I think we got a microphone coming your way. Do you think that the testing protocol, the ASTM standard for testing, um, might have something to do with the fact that the only the ten percent of orthophosphate that you that we noticed in there. Do you think that plays into it at all? So yeah, the question is, uh, does the does the testing standard play into it? I would say yes. Um, there's hold times associated with these samples that have to be met. You know, there's 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 good samples and there's bad samples. I mean. Um, but yeah, how we measure this is really important. I, th I think um, Minnesota is kind of leading the way with changing their regulatory approach to total dissolved phosphorus instead of this orthophosphate. And I think that's probably a wise decision. Who else? All right, well, thank you very much. And- uh, Actually, I had a quick question. Oh yeah, please. Um... Have you looked into phosphorus recovery at all? Um, it is a non-renewable resource. Yes, so good question. Phosphorus recovery. Um, I know that, I know Clean Water Services in Oregon has a pretty good program for that. Um, and I think Tacoma is looking at phosphorus reclamation as well. So that's typically a little easier in wastewater conditions. You know, you've got those higher concentrations to deal with, and you've got larger processes that can facilitate that. In disconnected stormwater treatment practices, um, it would be a little trickier to, to keep that water and long enough in order to get the phosphorus out of it. But yeah, it's a good question. If somebody can come up with a way to do that for everyday stormwater, you'd be doing all right. All right, well, thank you very much. Appreciate your time.